Receive the greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are going to go to the word of God in the book of Isaiah 53. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today. And I want to remind you Jesus Christ says no one can come to him unless the father who sent him draws them to him. And he continued to say, whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast them out. So I want you to understand that you are not here by mistake. It's not even by your choice. But Jesus has pointed a finger in you to be here today. You could have been anywhere else. But Jesus Christ wanted you to be here and for that reason, because Jesus said, he will not cast you out. No one whosoever can cast you out. I want you to clap hands for Jesus for that. He allowed you to come in his house. Verse 5, one verse only, chapter 53, verse 5 of Isaiah. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, and we thank you that, Lord, you'll give us direction and instruction from your word. Give us the capacity to carry your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We are going to speak under the theme that says perfect peace. Somebody say perfect peace. Where we have read, the Bible talks about this is about Jesus being crucified. This is one of the verses that we use in this church. It's part of the throne in this house. But we usually use it when we are talking about the healing that by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. But it's pegged. That verse is pegged. I want us to pick the, the line that says he was punished for our peace. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Peace was bought by the price that cannot be compared to anything. Today, yet this is this is the virtue of heaven, we know, peace. Individuals, families, communities, and nations, to the point of global, the whole world, this is what everyone is lacking and looking for. Nation can go to war for peace sake. People died for peace sake. Though the Bible says Jesus Christ was punished to the point of death for me and you to live in peace and to have that peace. And yet today we still run short of that peace. Can I submit to you freely? When we don't live in peace, we are simply denying the power of the cross. Because it was the punishment he received on my behalf and your behalf. Maybe you don't know the cost. The stripes that he received, it was for me and you to receive the peace. And when you read Isaiah 9 verse 6, the Bible declares him as the prince of peace. He pioneered that peace. So, when we don't live in peace, 
When we don't have peace, we are dethroning him on his title and we are challenging who he is because he is the prince of peace. So, every time you find yourself licking peace or not living in peace, you have removed Christ from his throne. You have removed Christ from who he is because he is the prince of peace. That peace is available. How is it made available? Because Jesus Christ was punished for it. For me and you to have it. It came through such a punishment. When we read Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the Bible says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So, because peace has been found through the cross, through the punishment that Jesus went through, how do I attain that which is already available? Isaiah 26 make it clear. We say, me and you, we must trust the Lord. We must trust in him. We must rely in him. We must have confidence on what he says. Regardless of what is happening around us, we stand by what he says, not because of circumstances, because circumstances will come and go, and they will change, but Jesus Christ, who said, trust in me for peace, he does not change. Number two, that he pointed them, he said, those who fixed their thoughts unto him, he will keep them. It's not your responsibility to keep yourself in peace. It is his responsibility to keep you in peace. Moreover, not just peace, but perfect peace. So when me and you we fixed our minds, just like when you fix your money, you know, the accounts that when you fix them, they will tell you, that no matter what happens, if you fix this for 12 months, it doesn't matter what will happen to you, you don't come and claim it. So, for you to live in perfect peace, it depends on how much and for how long are you willing to fix your mind unto Jesus? You see, if you fix your money and you come across situations, it's up to you because you are a free moral being. You can go and break the bank and say you need your money. But do you know that in the process of doing that, you are not going to get your money only. <laughs> you get the money of so ever is in the bank. What does this mean? When you're a child of God, you lack peace. Your lack of peace does not affect you only. It affects even people surrounding you. If I'm a pastor and I don't have peace, you'll hear even when I preach. So what happened to the pastor? Who did what to the pastor? And if you're an evangelist, you don't have it. You do think that everybody will be surprised because when you don't have peace of God in you, everything around you gets to be affected by you lacking peace. And many people are trying to get it. And even today, they don't have it because peace that is released by the punishment of Jesus Christ, for me to attain it, it depends on two things. How much am I willing to trust the Lord? Two, how much am I willing to fix my thoughts unto God? Regardless of circumstances and situations, am I willing to stand by what Jesus said? Okay, let's move on. What chases away peace and what attracts peace? to come to me, not for it to be released, because it's already released by the punishment. So, 
Why people don't have peace, don't peace, is there. Churches don't have peace. Families don't have peace. Nations don't have peace. Individuals don't have peace. Other people to the point of committing suicide because they are lacking peace. Let's check in the word of God. There are things that when you do, you chase peace away. Though peace is there. Philippians 4. Though peace is available, you can be a Christian who don't have peace. Though it's there, there are things that when you do, there's nothing that God can do. Because Jesus has already done the perfect work. What chases away peace and what can attract peace that is already there to come to me. Philippians chapter 4. We are reading verse 6 and 7. This is what chases peace. Don't worry about anything. Let's pause there. (laughs) The Bible says, don't worry about anything. Anything, it means anything to the absent of nothing. There is nothing that makes, should make a child of God to find herself or himself worrying. Whatever it is, I know many people, they try to justify their worry. But let me tell you, when you worry, when God said do not worry, you have become your own God. Because He is saying, don't do that. So, those who don't fix their minds on him, they will do it anyhow. And when they do it, they don't expect to lack peace. They still think they'll have peace somehow. But let me tell you, when you worry, it's an alarm enough for peace to go away. So I'm not needed and I'm not welcome. You are chasing peace away. And the Bible continues to say, pray about everything. (laughs) Everything means everything. But most of us, we prefer to talk about everything. Not to pray about everything. And because you have a mouth, you think you have a reason to talk about this thing. Let's talk about this thing. But the Bible says, I'm trying to read from the simplest version we can. Pray about everything. Let me tell you something that is very simple. I talk this about before when you're teaching the youth. There are two things that you can do when you're in a situation. is to talk about it, then you pray about it. So that you don't pray detail or gossip. You talk about this thing, then you pray about it, then you close it, you go to Thanksgiving. That's the procedure. But if you pray about something and go and talk about it, you have wiped away the prayer that you made. And most of us, we pray a lot. Two hours, three hours. When we finish, we say, now we have prayed. Now let's talk about it. You are just like a person who never prayed at all. Because you pray about it. When you pray about it, the Bible says this is what you do when you're praying. Making petitions to God. Tell God what you need. (laughs) Don't tell people, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. You see, you cannot thank God for all he has done if you don't know what he has done. Most of us, we know what is troubling us. But we don't know what God has done. And we take our troubles and God said that 
I've already perfected it. And said, God, maybe you don't understand how it's happening. God said, it is already done. Can you thank me for that? No, we don't. We talk about it and pray about it and then talk about it again. That's why we don't have that peace. The Bible says, then, then, when you do that, that is then you will experience. Then it means as a result of what you did before, then what? You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. When you talk about it, and pray about it and thank God about it, then you will experience the peace that surpasses your understanding. You know, because when you talk about it, you want people to understand what you're saying. But you don't get peace by talking understanding. <laughs> you get peace by praying about what is troubling you. When you do that, then God, because peace is not from understanding, it's from Jehovah. When you do that, he gives you peace that surpasses passes all understanding. All you can try to put together. That's why I'm not surprised. Things that you accumulated, thinking that it will give you peace based on your understanding. Even today you don't have it. Why? Peace does not come from your understanding. It comes from the Lord. It is not you who received the punishment of peace. It was him whom they strike for me to get peace. And when I do like that, he guard my heart with peace. What does it mean to guard my heart with peace? This simply means, some of you ask yourself, is it God speaking to me or not? No, God has never spoke to me. I don't know how God speaks. Does God speak? This is how he speaks. He speaks to you through the peace in you. What does it mean to guard your mind and your heart with peace? Whatever you do which does not give you peace, don't do it. <laughs> that is a volume enough that God is telling you something. If you insist to do things that does not give you peace, don't expect him to say anything to you because you have challenged him on who he is. Remember? Isaiah 9 verse 6. He speaks to you. He guard your mind and your heart through peace. I want to do this. Don't do that. You, don't, you know you don't even have peace about it. But you insist to do it. Don't buy that. You don't even have peace about it. But you continue to do that. Wake up. Pray about this thing. You don't wake up and pray. When you wake up in the morning, you don't have peace. He told you in the midnight, wake up and pray. Now you are surprised. You are in a conundrum. And what is happening with me? He communicated to your heart through peace. And you didn't. All right, let's continue. Now, because this peace, let's go to John. John chapter 14. If you're still thinking we are going far, we are about to finish. John 14. Verse 27, it says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. You see, when God is talking about peace, it is a gift. You cannot work for it. There is a punishment enough for you to have it. And it is freely given. The challenge is that 
Most of us as children of God, we don't know how to receive the gift. That's why we work for the gift. For me to give you the gift is from my own discretion. You don't have to do anything for me to give you. Jesus, heaven concluded that men don't have peace. Man is living in sin. Jesus Go and die for them. No one stood up and said, Father, we are troubled in our minds. Come and give us peace. No, it is a gift. But do you know how to receive? Because it is a gift. That's why people sweat a lot. People pray a lot. People fast a lot. And still they don't have it. It does not come by fasting. It does not come by sweating. It comes by you knowing how to receive it from God. And now we behave as the world. Because the, Jesus said, I do not give you peace as the world gives. That simply means that there's a way that the world gives peace. Which is not the way of God. My mind, your mind, so much troubled. Being in the house of the Lord. And I say I'm a child of God. I'm following Jesus. But my mind, I don't have peace. Jesus said, receive the gift. It's the gift that came through punishment. But most of us, we are agitated. We are unsettled in our mind. When we wake up in our mind, in the morning, we are messed up. Why? We are trying to get it by things that does not give it. Materially is the way of the world to give you peace. <laughs> and it is temporary. That's why even when you... It's not wrong to have material. But material should not give me peace. Why? Because the Bible says everything that appear, everything that do appear, is subjected to change. That's why you bought a car thinking it's the latest car in the market. And within two months it changed. Now you are in debt because you want to afford the one that is in the market now. You want to get peace. It does not come by that. Peace does not come by how much. The Bible says man's worth the Bible says man's worth is not determined by the material that one possess. It's determined by who you have. If you have Jesus, the Prince of Peace, he will keep me in perfect peace. And he keep me even when I don't want to be kept. When I feel like I will throw my... I will throw hands in the air. Jesus said, don't do that. I want to keep you when you don't want to be kept. Most of us, we are after many things thinking that they will give us peace. That state of tranquility. To be content when I have or when I don't have. But we are not like that. We are fighting over each other. We talk bad about each other because I think talking bad about somebody will give me a certain level and leverage of peace. Can I tell you something? There is something that I told myself lately when I studied something like this. There's nothing that you can do for me to have peace. And there's nothing that you can do for me to to lose my peace. Because my peace does not come from you. It comes from God. And if you didn't give it to me, you can't take it away from me. So for me to be happy, you don't have to do anything. When I wake up in the morning, I have a certain level of standard. So when you come to me, you speak good or bad. It does not affect me. It's up to you. I am settled and I'm content. I'm in the state of tranquility. I'm okay. You cannot talk 
me out of the peace because he didn't talk me in the peace. People, they move from church to church. No, the pastor didn't talk right about me. No, the evangelist was talking to me bad. Come on, does your peace come from the evangelist? You're going to make up your mind. Your peace come from Jesus. No, I was praying for long. I thought my prayers would have been answered already. Come on, the Bible says, fix your mind, fix your mind, fix it. If he say he will give you, he will give you in his time. But you pray in your time, and he give you in his time. You can't manipulate him. Shake your neighbor, stay in peace, stop there. Stop it. Just stop it. Just, just, that peace is not from anything that you can do. When you wake up in the morning, smile alone, get in the mirror and say, I'm okay with myself. I don't care when I go to work who's going to speak what about me. When I go to school, when you come and talk good, you are coming from here, we are going up together. But when you come to try to speak bad about me, I'm telling you down there, I'm not going. It's too clouded. Many people don't have peace. I'm not going down there. I'm moving from here upwards. It's overcrowded down here. Church people are over there. The world is over there. The nations are over there. They are trying to, to sign the peace treaty. Killing one another for peace. Peace sake. I'm not going down there. And you can't, meet, you can't take me down there. Say what you want to say. You didn't give me this peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. If you want something to make you, to tickle your emotion for you to be good. Come on, you're late. You're wasting your time. That's why God said, even if I were hungry, I could not tell you. Why? Because you can give me food when you want to. So, you know, I know I need peace so much. I don't need you to tell me anything. Keep quiet. Talk. I have it. And I'm sorted and I'm fixed. I'm, gonna, I'm okay. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. When I'm not talking to you, it doesn't mean that I'm having, I don't have peace. I'm in meditation of the one who gave me peace. I'm okay with that. You have moved me out of that. You didn't give me it. The world peace is through compromise. You got to compromise something in order to get it. No, I'm not compromising anything. I have nothing to give to the devil. Devil, you got nothing that you're getting this time. Never, no. No, I'm not getting anything. Our devil has been giving us a hard time. It's time to give the enemy a hard time. The devil, no, not this time. I'm here to give the devil a hard time. I'm not going to lose a piece over you. I'm not going to lose a piece because I don't have a car. I'm not going to lose a piece because I don't have a house. I'm not going to lose peace because I don't have a job. No, I refuse. And let me tell you something about the devil. Everything that the devil is doing to you, he's not after you, he's after your peace. If the devil can locate what steal your peace, floodgates is coming. If money make you to lose peace, make sure that you are broke for months, boy. He knows that when you don't have money, everybody must know. Even your enemies must know. Even people who are trying to bewitch you, you must go and borrow from them. He's not after your money. The devil don't buy. Do you think if the devil can take your account to zero, zero tomorrow, you're going to find him in the shop? He don't buy. You think if the devil can make your car to stuck, you will find him behind the steering wheel driving tomorrow. It's not about your car. But he knows that when your car is stuck, uh, you lose your peace. Everybody must know. I remember when I was staying in Pretoria. I woke up one day, I was supposed to come here in church. I said, I'm going to church. I have money, I don't have money. I begin to, I begin to calculate. When I arrive at Fountain next to Unisa, when I arrive in Centurion, I'm talking when I don't have money. I've settled already to say, money or no money, I'm going to church. If I have to walk to church, I'm going to church, I will walk. 
are going to pass at Midran and go behind the main track there. And go. When I was still talking about that, because my mind is fixed on doing what the Lord wants me to do. Somebody call me and say, where are you? And say, I'm home. He said, I'm going to church. Let's go. I said, thank you, Jesus. My mind was made up already. I'm going to church. I'm going to church because I've got money to go to church. I'm going to church because I've got a peace of mind. Yes. You think when the devil is blocking your children, it's about your children. He knows that you're going to go to the Sangoma trying to get help for your children. You lose peace. It's not about your children. It's about your peace. He wa he, once he knows what can steal your peace, he's going to use it. You're going to tell everybody, talk about everybody. You don't pray. You don't thank God. You are raising your issues. And you don't have the peace that surpasses our understanding. We need to be settled. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do because I have the peace of God. It doesn't matter who say what. I have the peace of God. And I am going to live in the peace of God. We are going to read the last scripture. How do you stand and maintain it? Because it has been released for you and me. And the devil is trying to mess up with it. How do I... You know, lack of peace can make you change your language. I tell you, I'm going to tell you, I don't mind, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm at peace. You see, as pastors, the Bible says, pray for them that are in authority so that they will live in peace. You see, when you don't pray for us and we lack peace, you don't have to come at my home to know that I don't have peace. Come on Wednesday evening. You'll hear it from here. Oh my God. What happened to the pastor? What is he talking about? The peace. I don't have. It does not come because you're a pastor. It comes by you fixing your mind in Christ. It does not come because you are a prayer warrior. You can be a prayer warrior who pray without peace. It comes through me fixing my mind and trusting the Lord. Judges chapter 6. I love this part that we are going to. The evangelist was teaching us on Tuesday. You must, you must fight. You must fight. So I love that. I, we are going to the book of Judges. Are you finding it? Yeah, it's, on. it's hard sometimes to get it. It's in the Old Testament. If you don't find it, go to the table of contents. I want us to read, see. This is the story when Gideon, listen attentively because you're about to wrap up. Gideon, after God has raised him and give him the strength and the courage to tell him that well, Gideon, you are a mighty man of war. What you, you are a mighty speak. man of valor. You it speak. doesn't matter where you are coming but from, but according to me, what you are a mighty man. Then, Gideon, Gideon, he come in a state where he wanted to see whether God is with him or not. And this was an encounter with the angel. Then he asked for a sign from an angel that if the Lord is with me, alright this is what I'm requesting you to do then the angel said no it's fine that is okay so the angel performed what he promised to Gideon but do you know that after that the devil brought the spirit of fear in Gideon simply because he saw the mighty works of God. I know even some of you, there is something that God did to you and you still feel like maybe, maybe something bad is going to happen. Maybe. No, 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 no. 
That's the works of the devil. That's how the devil do. If God has blessed you, has blessed you, it's full and fine. And so Gideon, when you go to verse 23, God has to talk to him. Because now he was saying, I have seen the Lord face to face through the angel. Now I will die. Then when you read that verse 23, Judges 6, 23. Your, your, your Bible may start by saying, Peace be with you. <laughs> Where I'm reading is it is all right. <laughs> Peace be with you, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid, you will not die. Verse 24. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh, Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer. To this day, let's pause there. When God tell him that Gideon, don't be scared, don't be afraid. Yes, you have seen the Lord, and I see you're afraid now. But to you, I'm coming with a message. Shalom, peace. Do not be afraid. You will not die. Then the Bible says Gideon built an altar there. And he said, This altar, I name it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. <laughs> he don't just have peace, the Lord is peace until this day. That word shalom. I know most of us we greet each other using that word. It's okay. We use it for salutation, greetings. Shalom, shalom. But I want to tell you to show you what are you saying when you say shalom. So that we use it effectively and for the benefit of the saints and for everybody. Because first thing, of course, shalom it means God is peace. My God is peace. And the second thing it means harmony. Harmony. So when I'm saying shalom, already I'm saying, if you've got a qualm with me, let it be settled when we're shaking hands. Now. If you're coming for some issues, when I say shalom, you're saying it's over. God is peace over whatever is troubling us. That's number two. And it means completeness. It's complete. Not bits and pieces of things. That simply means nothing is missing and nothing is broken. I am okay. <laughs> Once you say shalom to somebody, nothing is missing and nothing is broken. I'm okay. The last one, which I want quickly to focus on, it means prosperity. <laughs> I'm saying, Prosper in every way of your life. Hey, Once I say shalom, I'm saying prosper. Even in areas that seems like you're blocked in. Shalom. Shalom. It is well with you. Go and prosper in everything. But unfortunately, because this word prosperity has been badly talked. Even today in the church, if I come here and say, the theme is oh prosperity. Man, oh, my God. Everybody will say, I've started. You know why? Yes, the God. devil wants to take you out of prosperity until even preachers can preach prosperity oh, as if it's bad. Oh, and you know why he wants that? Yes, he wants to steal your peace. Because Prosperity, it simply means to have enough and whatever it takes for me to do the will of God. So if you say, don't preach prosperity, and we are his will, already you are contradicting his will already. How can you say, if you said, don't listen to prosperity, and I come to your corner, do you really hate prosperity? And let me show you what makes people think prosperity is bad. It's because people think prosperity is money. And prosperity 
is not only money. It means all I supposed to have in order to do the will of God. If I have to have money to do the will of God, I must have it. What's wrong with that? If you have to have a car to do the will of God, have it. But those who don't have cars and who are not concerned about prosperity, they'll be telling you that ah, church is not about a car. No, I need a car to do the will of God. I cannot walk to Limpopo when I'm going to preach. I need a car. I must prosper where cars is concerned. The evangelist cannot go to Zimbabwe by walking. You cannot get into the horse and say, let's go to... We need cars. We must prosper where cars is concerned. We want to do the will of God. I mean, you mean if I don't even have money to pay electricity, I can't even read the word of God in the evening because I don't have money to pay electricity. The devil is a liar. He needs this prosperity. Shalom to you. Come on. How will I live? I am broke. I have nothing. I can't tithe. I can't offer. And you tell me that prosperity, you're not supposed to talk about prosperity. It is time to talk about it. We want to do the will of God. You want your children to go to school. And you are going to Omachoni. And you come to church. The preachers say we are talking about prosperity. And say, ah, they have started. Your child must go to university. And you must be prospering one way or the other for them to go to university. Otherwise, they'll fight against you. Your children will kill you. I need to go to university. You don't have money. What are you saying? Why don't you pray about it? The Bible says pray about everything. And everything means everything. If this church had to have a flight, a jet, in, in order for us to do the will, you, say, you are thinking small if you are still not thinking like that. Do you think if the Jesus said this grace is for the whole world, we'll go to Asia driving a car? That's what you are thinking. If this grace has to go to Brazil, you think I'm going to get in the bus and go to Brazil? Yeah, we need all we need to have in order to do the will of God. Shalom. To you. Yeah, whether you hate it or not, well, because it's not from you, we'll give it anyway. It's not from you. Shalom. Shalom. Gideon built an altar. So this altar, it must remain forever. But I want us to look at something quickly. Because he was challenged when he built that altar. And God has to order him to say, you know, there are other altars that you must build in order to sustain your peace. There are things that you need to have in order for your peace to complete. No, I'm not talking even about material things. Let's read. Let's read. This is what you are going to do. Now get ready. Get ready. You are going to do something now. Verse 25. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's head. The one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. You see, there are, there are altars that you must break down that are speaking against your shalom. Just because your father didn't have anything and that's what you believe in, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to have nothing. Break down that altar. That Ashra pole must go down. Gideon was told, you need to break down this altar that is standing next to the altar of peace. If your mother was caught in the spirit of witchcraft, it doesn't mean that you have to be a witch. Break down that altar. It's not for you. You are blocked by what block your mother? Is your mother God? Break down the altar. And those altars are standing against most of us. You know, even when you're in the house of the Lord, we are not settled at all. The Bible says, verse 26, then build an altar. You see, you cannot... Uh, this is what happened. Most of us, we build an altar on top of the altar. That's why you have temporary peace. <laughs> you are happy today, tomorrow you are frowning. Break this altar first and put this one that will stand forever, the altar of peace. 
That's why you're moody. Today you're smiling, tomorrow you're moody. Break that altar first and stand by this one of peace that say whether I have or I don't have, I'm okay. My mind is fixed on Jesus. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on hilltop sanctuary. Line the stone carefully. Sacrifice the bull as burnt offering on the altar. Using as fuel and wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord has commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father. You see, there are people from your father's house also who are willing for you not to have peace at all. <laughs> they are all out. I know you love them. But there are people that are all out. Gideon had to do it in the night. Because he was scared. Or, hey, they can come and disrupt me while I'm sleeping. You will see when we go down here. Early the next morning as the people of the town began to stay, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down. And that the Ashra pole beside it has been cut down. In their place, a new altar has been built. You see, today, we're going to build some new altars for you and me to live in peace, not according to how people give us, but according to how God has given us peace. There was a new altar that is built, and there on it were the remains of the bull that has been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? You see, can I warn you? Some of you, when you are going to break this altar, those altars, you will receive some calls. Because people who are fortifying the call for you, the altar for you not to have peace, they will have been affected. So they must call to find out who, who did this, where. Ashra Paul is dead. Who kill our gods? And it says, then people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, you see, it's going to be a careful search. They will look for you. They learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the man of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. Do you know that some of you, by reversing, there are people who are not talking to you and they will never talk to you anymore. You know why? The thing that they were thinking that they will hold you forever is broken. So they hate you for that. But today, they have got something coming. Yeah. Verse 31. But Joah shouted to the mob. He said, it's a mob. That confronted him. Why are you defending Baal? <laughs> hey, ask him, why are you defending Baal? I know you love that person, you love those yes, friends. We have a but hey, they are against you. Why are you defending that? Joash said, he's the father of Gideon. Why are you defending Baal? Will he, you argue his case? Whoever pleases his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. If Baal is God, why are you speaking for him? Let him stand and speak for himself. <laughs> why are you protecting rubbish? Break down that thing. It's the very same thing. That don't want you to have your shalom. Do you know that some of you to pro not to prosper? Regardless of what is being said in the house of the Lord. I've learned something. It is the church, it is the people in the church who makes people who are not believers to stand against the church. You know what you go out and say? Yes, in ah, they need money. You are telling somebody who has never been here. And they say, we told you. The church is about money. They've never been in the door of the church even a single day. When the devil empowered them to do that, he wants to move you out of your peace. 
Truth be told, you, you are not Kute supposed so to be renting by now. Uh, come on, uh, let's make this thing. You are not supposed to be walking by foot. <laughs> but you know what is the reason? Uh, you went out there. Uh, you know what they are telling us in the church? I don't know. Do you think we should do it? How can you ask a heathen? How do the heathen know about the principles of God? So we must come here and lie to each other. Come on, I'm not worshipping Baal. I'm worshipping Jesus, the Prince of Peace. I'm not going to speak here like I worship Baal. I break Baal. Let Baal defend himself. If he's a God, let him talk. You know, if Baal is your God, serve him. <laughs> but God, if he's God, serve him. Let's stand up on our feet. I want us to go today there are some altars that are standing against the peace that God through Jesus Christ has already released for you and me. But today, we don't have peace. You were surprised why? There are some altars that are standing. But that peace from God, when Gideon found it, God said, build the altar that will remain, even to You see, it's about fixing. So the question is, how long are you willing to fix your mind on God on what he said? I want you to minister to somebody before we pray. Shake somebody by and say shalom. Shake three people. Come on, just shake three people. Say, I know when you come to church, you are so messed up in your mind, but shalom. Shalom. And you need to know what you're saying. Move to somebody else. Say, move to someone and say shalom. I know when you come here. Come on, move to somebody. Don't be stingy. Shalom. You are saying complete. Before you are even prayed for today, I know you came sick, but shalom. Move to somebody. We are about to break the altar. And I know you are not the altar that is standing against me because if you are the one, you will be broken down today. Move to somebody. Don't just stand and look at people. We say move around and tell somebody shalom. If they are not smiling, say, hey, what went wrong? Shalom. You are sick? Shalom. It's fine. Shalom. <laughs> Tell them. I know you are here to be laid hands for something, but shalom. Shalom. Receive. We are about to break down such altars. And if you are here, you hate somebody. Hey, go to that person and say shalom. Nothing is missing. Nothing is broken. We are okay. We are fine. Shalom. I know you can't go, but we pray. You know, the anointing in this house, they will clap you. Come on. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. Come on. Come on. Let's praise the name of Jesus. Let's exalt Jesus. Shalom. Let the peace of God be upon you. Let the peace of God be upon you. Shalom. I want you now to lift up your voice as you can and do what Gideon did. And break any other thing that you think is the one that is making you to lose your peace. Whatever it is, whatever, it seems like it's fortified enough. It's not. Today, through the power of your words, standing on Luke 10, 19, saving the God of fire, you will break every altar. You have to build an altar, not on top of the altar, but on a clean space.